I don't think that people in, in the United States, uh, certainly, or even in Western Europe understand how shocking it is to have confiscated all your foreign currency reserves in, in, that you've deposited in the United States and, and Western banks. It, it, this is shocking. I mean, they, they just went ahead and stole it. Uh, this is asset forfeiture. Uh, it, it is a practice that in the United States is quite common and, and it's highly destructive. It's basically the law enforcement says, oh, we think you're guilty of a crime, so we're going to take your stuff, your money, your car, your house, even in some cases. It's really a Did despicable- Did you say Abramovich? Did you say Abramovich? Uh, yeah, well, it, it doesn't really matter if you if you like these oligarchs or not. That's not the point. The point is the central bank hitting them at, in their reserves. I mean, that would if I'm an asset manager at a central bank, I'm scared. I'm all of a sudden thinking, you know, if, if my government just does something that the Americans don't like, are they going to steal my money too? the money that I'm responsible for, the, the money of my country? I'd be scared. And, and I, the Americans don't seem to realize how this policy was it, it's going to be viewed retrospectively as one of the most traumatic things ever in, in financial period of this time because so many other central banks are looking at this horrified. And they're thinking, how do we get out of America without anybody noticing? And, and that is the key issue because see, if a lot of these asset managers, I mean, uh, the, the three of us, we, we have, you know, we have a little bit of sophistication in these kinds of things. So we know how these guys think. They're not gonna make a, a trigger happy decision. They're gonna take their time, but they're gonna slowly edge their way to the door insofar as holding on to dollar assets. If I'm an, I'm an asset manager, I'm getting out of the dollar, I'm getting out of all treasuries, but I'm not gonna do it in a way that is no, that, that people notice it. I'm just gonna like sl slowly start, like not going to the two year auctions, you know, slowly divesting myself and swapping it out. You know, lots of swaps are gonna start happening, uh, uh, asset swaps, whereby it, it's a trading situation where you have a particular asset and you, I, I'm ex explaining to the, to the listeners, you as an asset manager, you have some particular asset and you want to get out of it, but you don't really want cash. And so you go to a counterparty and say, you know, I've got, I don't know, 30 year treasury bonds, you know, maturing in, in 2045. Uh, give me, you know, I don't know, Chinese bonds or, or give me the, the bonds of a uh, commodities rich country like like Chile, for instance. Give me Chilean bonds, which are rock solid because of the commodities. And, and you know, you swap out your positions. And it's actually very difficult for the Federal Reserve to realize when treasury bonds are being swapped out because it's not a sale. They're just swapping it. And because of that, the, the Treasury, um, the, the Federal Reserve, excuse me, and the Treasury Department for that matter, they know that they have treasury bonds outside of the United States in sovereign wealth funds, but they don't know really who holds them because it's self-reporting. And so a lot of I'm, this is a supposition on my part. I, I come from a banking background, so this is kind of like stuff that I know, I grew up with, you know. Um, I'm guessing that a lot of fund managers have exited their positions or are in the process of planning how to exit their positions by way of swaps so as to make it as quiet as possible. Uh, I don't know if this was too obscure for the audience, but it's it's very important because it'll mean that there will be more and more weakness uh, in the dollar, more and more inflation because of people exiting the dollar and getting into other asset classes. Absolutely, now can I just say something? I think the other thing that's been propping up the dollar over the last 10 years, 10, 15 years, is that up to now, there hasn't been that alternative safe haven. So mm -hmm. people have been increasingly, I think, uneasy about the things that the United States has been doing politically. They've also been increasingly uneasy about many of its economic policies. But the dollar is still there. Um, it's still the, the, you know, the world's reserve currency. It's still the currency that's used for trading in goods and commodities. So at the end of the day, you have no real option but to put your yeah. money in dollars. And that's mm -hmm. been... The thing that's kept the dollar up, you know, there. What they've just done is going to make it much more likely that before very long, we are going to start seeing safe haven alternatives. Chinese currency be used as the anchor for ru ruble rupee trades. 
Mm, yeah. It's, uh, you know, yeah. an alternative system of financial architecture being established in which you don't have to put your money in dollars anymore in order mm -hmm. to find a safe asset. And yeah. that, it, if that crystallizes over the next, I mean, it'd still take a few years, I think, to fully crystallize. Oh, sure. But if oh, it yeah. crystallizes, then to be straightforward about this, especially if this administration continues along the path that it's, which is going, which of course it will, because it knows no other, then I can very easily see an implosion. <laughs> and this is something yeah. that I think people in the US need to understand. Yeah. Whereas an implosion, yeah. I mean, you know, not a collapse, there will always be a uh, value for the dollar because, of course, it's a huge economy still and all that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. an implosion of the dollar's position as the world's reserve currency, it, it, it will suddenly and dramatically shift. And at that point, of course, the United States will be faced for the first time um, with the challenge of having to decide how it's going to live within its means. Because yeah. that's what the U.S. hasn't been doing for no. at least 30 years now, at least certainly since the uh, um, end of the Clinton era. Yeah. Uh, and I would also uh, I, I would venture to speculate something. And th this is just throwing it out there. I would think that the, the currencies that people are going to start to get into are the currencies of commodities rich countries, uh, the Russian ruble, uh, the Chilean peso the Canadian dollar of all things, the, the, country, uh, the Australian dollar. See, the countries that have commodities that have, and not just, you know, a, a few commodities, but, you know, industrial metals, uh, food, food production, I think is going to be a big deal. I mean, something that three years ago, you'd be laughed out of the room if you said that there was going to be food insecurity and that agricultural commodities were going to be a big player. Well, they're looking like they're going to be a very big player this year because of, uh, of the fertilizer issue and the fact that Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine control, uh, you know, such a huge market in the agro commodities. I, I, I'm guessing that the currency of the future, the currencies of the future will be the countries that have large commodity positions, export commodity positions. Wow, this is fun. This is gonna be really cool. <laughs> I, 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 I entirely agree. Anyway, I mean, the point is, I don't think this administration understands any of this. I think that uh, I think it was you who said uh, some time ago, Gonzalo, in a previous live stream that we did, that they still live and function within this architecture that has existed for so long yeah. and which has always been up to now so stable. They yeah. cannot contemplate a reality beyond this. What uh, what happens next, uh, guys? Where do we go from Alexander? here? What does what what does the U.S. have to do? What does the EU have to do? Can they uh, can they tell Zelensky to to surrender and to walk everything back? Can they roll some of these uh, sanctions back, or is it a one way one way street? Is uh, what about Russia? What yeah. about Russia? Yeah, what I, do they do? Is it a one way street I, for them? They have to right. win. Can they I can they negotiate a settlement? I think I think the Germans and the French, but especially the Germans, this is my sense from Germany, are starting to get vertigo <laughs> about what they've done. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, 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 I think this that, you know, they're beginning to understand that some of these ideas, you know, about phasing out oil, Russian oil and Russian coal and Russian gas and all that within a year is simply not practical. And that the uh, hit that Germany stands to suffer from all of this is enormous. And not just a, a short-term hit, but a long-term one as well. Yeah. As I've said many times, we have a very weak, very inexperienced German government, which just didn't understand what it was doing. Uh, and I think they expected that announcing this massive shock and awe sanctions would provoke a political and financial crisis in Russia, the banking system would collapse there, the oligarchs would move, Putin would be overthrown, and it hasn't happened. So what they're trying to do at the moment, the French and the Germans, because this is the weakness of the French, Macron cannot ever bring himself to break with the Germans. He could have done it, he'd no. done it a few weeks ago, that was, his, that was his opportunity, that was his moment to shine. 
he balked. He just couldn't bring himself conceptually to break mm -hmm. with the Germans. But mm -hmm. what I think they're trying to do is they're trying to get the Russians to stop. They want to try and get the Russians. They're talking all the time to the Russians. Let's have this ceasefire. And what's mm. happening is the Russians are coming back and they are saying, no, we are not mm. interested in a ceasefire at the moment. We are going to see this operation completed. Um, uh, 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 Gonzalo, at an earlier point in this live stream, you said, uh, uh, we're going to continue. We're going to continue it no matter what. Yeah. And if you actually go to one of the Kremlin readouts, I think it was with Macron, Putin mm -hmm. used those very same words to to Macron, according to again, readout, great minds no think alike. No matter what, <laughs> exactly. So I think the Germans and the French are becoming increasingly nervous and increasingly stressed about this. I think that they've also grasped that. Financial sanctions simply cannot go further without causing real, real damage. Well, obviously, there's already been enormous damage, but yeah. um, potentially exponential damage to the European economy. So I think they've maxed out on the financial sanctions. I think the energy sanctions, I think they're beginning to understand that even if they were to succeed in this hopeless endeavor of stopping Russian oil imports and coal imports and even eventually gas imports. There is a world market in coal, gas and oil. And if you cut out Russian oil, gas and coal, that will leave you with structurally higher energy prices, which will translate into structurally higher inflation. And of course, if you know anything about Germany, you know that the entire country is designed to work in a low inflation situation. So I think the yeah. Germans and the French have a sense of vertigo. At the moment, because they're still caught up in the hysteria of the hour, the hysteria of this month of March, which mm. we're only halfway through, by the way, they <laughs> can't no. turn around and start reversing some of the things they've done. So no. they still have to keep pushing the only yeah. thing they can do is come back and repeatedly ask Putin for this ceasefire. But eventually, and I think over time, we are going to start to see some kind of a pullback. And it's noticeable that already there's been splits between the Americans and the Europeans over oil, that the Americans imposed this embargo on themselves, the Europeans didn't. So we, 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 we're going to start to see, I predict, sometime in the autumn, so late summer, autumn, once this military operation in Ukraine has achieved its objectives, we're going to start to see people coming up, trying to put some of the pieces together again. I think that's probably where we're going to end up. So sometime around the autumn, we'll start to see the dialogues resume, Perhaps some of these companies that pulled out tentatively trying to get back in, some of the linkages being restored. That's my that's my feeling. And by the way, interestingly enough, there's also been some articles in some of the British media that have been talking about this as well. That you know, we've got to try after all this is over, trying to find some way to repair some of this damage. We will never be able to repair all of it. And um the thing that I've come to realize, and it's um, deeply troubled me, is that this sort of wave of anger towards Russia mm. Mm. has been clearly building up for years. And it goes much further and much deeper amongst much larger sections of the European population than I had ever realized. I mean, I, I'm baffled by it. I don't completely understand it, but it, it, it's welled up in this extraordinary way. And I think that the Russians, for their part, have seen it. And I think that they're going to make the decision now that after this, there's never any going back. There's no going back to Europe in the way that there was from now on. You know, it's ourselves alone with our friends, um, in the East, the days of Russia,
thinking of itself, conceiving as itself as part of Europe are ended and ended forever. I agree. I, and, and this is my, my thinking. See, uh, several facts come to mind. Number one, these sanctions and the anti-Russian hysteria have strengthened Putin's hand domestically. Okay, and you can say that, oh, you know, it's state run uh, polling uh, data. But yeah, but the general sense is that people are behind Putin. You don't need a, a, a polling station to tell you that. that they are behind Putin. So it strengthens his hand. And I think that the Russians are going to realize, you know, we don't actually need Europe. They cut us off. The Europeans and the American cut, Americans cut us off. And how are you doing? Yeah, we took a hit, but we're still standing. And see, this is the thing. A lot of times people are more afraid of the hit. And, and so they will do a lot of things to avoid the hit. But when they finally get hit hard and they realize, hey, you know, it wasn't pleasant, but it was not the end of the world. I'm still standing. And the other guy doesn't have any anything else to hit me with. I think that the Russians are basically going to realize, you know, we don't need the Europeans. We don't need the Americans. And I disagree with you in, in your, you're thinking that in come the autumn or perhaps next year, a lot of these uh, foreign firms will try to weasel their way back into Russia, into the Russian markets, into relationships with Russian firms and, and whatnot. I do not believe that. Or, or let me phrase it. I think that they will try, but I think that they will find a very, very closed door because the Russians are not going to forget this. No, no way are they going to forget this because this was really trying to break the Russians, break the Russians' will by any means necessary. And I think that this kind of damage, which was inflicted on the Russian economy, but is not fatal, I think that it builds up antibodies. And I don't think that the American companies or the European companies will be welcomed back. And if they are welcomed back, it will be with such stringent conditions and enormous taxes and tariffs and fees and call them what you will, but there will be a concerted effort by, by Russia as a state to extract the maximum profit from these foreign companies that many of them will decide, you know, it might not be worth it. Many of them will try and thinking that maybe in a few years this will be sorted out, but I don't think it's ever going to be sorted out. And I think that this, uh, this was a, a true chopping of that umbilical cord between Russia and Europe and the West. I, I, I think that this is far more traumatic than people have realized. And that for the Russians, the, the, the consensus will be in Russia that this is it. We tried our best with the West, but they don't want us. They hate us. And the Chinese and the Indians love us. So why are we messing with these people who are, and, and this is the point of view of the Russians, and frankly, I agree with it. They're going to say the Europeans are decadent, degenerate, a dying people who are allowing themselves to be invaded. What do we need to do with these people? Nothing. We can go there on holidays, but we don't need to do business with them or be associated with them because they hate us. Whereas the Chinese love us. The Indians love us. So let's just pivot in that direction. I, I, I truly think that this is psychologically for the Russian people not just the leadership classes, but all Russians, this has been a, a traumatic experience. They're going to win the war, by the way. Uh, there, there's no question about that. But the relationship with the West, it's irretrievably broken. It, it will never, never go back to the status quo ante. Never. And the Russians will always view the West with contempt. Yeah. Uh, and that's my subjective appraisal. And, and I'm sure that a lot of people would disagree with this. Only time will tell. But you see, if a, if, if a whole society, a whole civilization rejects you and demonizes you. And before the broadcast, we were talking about uh, um, musicians, Russian musicians who were being persecuted and demonized. I mean, come on, Russian musicians. I mean, if they're musicians, they, they mean no one any harm. And they're being persecuted very much like uh, like uh, Jews in in you know the the 1930s in Germany. Hmm? It, it's absurd, and so I think that the Russians will never forget this, and they will carry this resentment. And what's the best way to resolve a resentment? There are two ways: you can either attack the people that you resent, or you can ignore them and turn away. And I think that that's the path that the Russians are going to take. 
Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, th I think they went too far. They, they yeah. went after the media, the censorship, going after people on a personal level. They, yeah. they, they took it way, way too far. Yeah. I mean, come on, like some, some conductor who gets kicked out of his job because he's Russian. There, there's some piano prodigy, some 20 year old kid, right? I mean, he, he doesn't, he's not involved in politics. He's playing piano all day for crying out loud, right? Uh, he's, he's uh, on the one hand, he's a nobody. I mean, very successful young musician and good friend of him. I actually don't know his name. I just read about the headline of it, that his tour was being canceled. And he's a 20 year old boy who never harmed anybody. He's been playing piano all of his life and, and he's being ostracized because he's Russian. That, that's just stupid. That's just, that, that's a way you make enemies, enemies who will never forget. Uh, that's the thing. Because people's memory are long, is, uh, um, you know, I, I, this is a disaster. It's a disaster for our civilization as a whole, because whether the, the Europeans or the Americans like it or not, Russia is a great European civilization. Russia has contributed to the West in immeasurable ways, in terms of music, in terms of art, in terms of architecture, and let's not even talk about literature. The greatest novelists ever were three. Dickens, Tolstoy, and Dostoevsky, and not in that order. We all know that the big T was the real guy there, okay? Followed by the big D, right? Uh, you know, they have contributed enormously to our culture, our civilization, and, and to marginalize it in such a petty way. It, it's unconscionable, and it's shocking, quite frankly. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, I've always admired Russian culture. I studied Russian history in university. I, I find it just shocking that it, it's being demonized this way in, in such a petty and low way by the leadership class in the West. I, 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 I don't think that I've ever seen that. I mean, I don't even think that in the Second World War, I don't think that they demonize German culture the way that Russian culture is being demonized now. And the West isn't even at war with Russia for crying out loud. Hello? Yeah, yeah, this, this, is, this, is, this, this is completely true. And uh, you know, obviously, I mean, I know some, I mean, I'm not for well, vast numbers of Russian friends, but I have some, and I know that they were profoundly shocked by, by this, even some of them who have been critical of the Putin government up to now yeah. and, you know, critical yeah. for all kinds of reasons. But I mean, the, 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 but it comes back to the point that Alex was making. There's an almost visceral outburst. There's, there's, one feels that this sort of welling anger and loathing has existed yes. there for a long time and it's been building up and it's been simmering under the surface and yeah, and suddenly it's now burst out into the open and it's and it's striking at every level. And I yeah. absolutely agree. I don't think the Russians will ever forget this. I, I think that this is something that um, um, immediately they have noticed. And by the way, there was there was one thing, in my opinion, which uh, hit home most immediately of all of the other things. And that was the closure of European airspace basically to flights from Russia, I mean from Aeroflot, because yeah. that basically was telling Russians, you're not wanted here. We don't want yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We unbelievable. You. I, 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 unbelievable. Yeah. Oh. Um, Gonzalo Alexander, false flag. Are you guys worried? Yes. Extremely worried. I, 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 I will genuinely say that I do believe that the Americans and the Ukrainians are playing a false flag, and I am extraordinarily worried. Um, I, I think that they have planted the notion that the Russians are losing this uh, conflict so that they can say, see, they're losing, and that's why they, they did this false flag uh, and, and use this false flag as a justification for NATO involvement in this conflict. And I think that um, the signs are all there. They're, they're talking about it openly that the Russians are going to do a false flag, which doesn't make any sense if you're winning. But of course, if you've told your own people that the Russians are losing, then it makes complete sense. Um, I, I'm deeply, deeply afraid of this because the, the, there, is a, there are several different segments within the American establishment that want a war very badly. 
There are the neocons who, for reasons of uh, their own, of, of uh, McCainian impotence, let's call it that, because that's what it really is, uh, from John McCain, his impotence at being uh, emasculated by the Vietnamese, he never got over that, and he's always hated the Russians for it. Uh, and then there's the issue of the Biden administration that wants to deflect from its responsibility for its mismanagement of the American economy and therefore, you know, blame it all on Putin. There is a segment of the uh, neoliberal economic establishment headed by Paul Krugman, who uh, I, he's a man whom I despise. I've had a couple of run ins on, with him back when I was writing uh, about finance. Uh, he honestly and truly believes that a war, uh, a, a global war, a world war, is the way to solve America's economic problems. I wish I were kidding, but that's what the man actually thinks. He's said so multiple times. And he's advocated openly for war with Iran and other countries as a way to kickstart the American economy and get it out of the doldrums that people like he himself caused by the deindustrialization of the United States. And, and those are just you know three, four groups that I'm mentioning. There are other groups, you know, Mitt Romney and the whole uh, a Raytheon industrial military complex who want, you know, war so that they can sell more equipment and get more money. You know, all kinds of different groups in the United States want a war with Russia. Uh, and so my, my terror is that they'll get their way and that people like Victoria Newland, Wendy Sherman, Anthony Blinken, who have a deep and abiding uh, ethno-religious hatred for Russia, because that, that's the only way that you can characterize their, their animus towards Russia. Well, they will do anything to cause a, 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 the conditions whereby NATO goes to war with Russia. And uh, that's why I believe that there's going to be a false flag. And that's why this, uh, this Russian strike on, on, the, on the, uh, the training center outside of Lviv, I think was so important because I think that the only people who might be rational in, at this moment is the, um, and I can't believe I'm saying this, is the US Pentagon. Because I think that they're the only people realizing that, no, we don't want to get involved with the Russians because it will get bad for us. It will get really bad for us. So let's just steer clear of this whole mess. I think that that's what the Pentagon is thinking. And let us hope that they have the political muscle, whatever is necessary, to prevent the United States from carrying out some grotesque uh, uh, false flag that will only hurt Ukrainian people and, and will con potentially widen this conflict in ways that are completely unpredictable and might wind up in the most uh, uh, you know, horrifying outcome. Yeah, uh, sorry for ranting like this, but it's something that I truly worry about. Alexander. I share your worry completely, Gonzalo, because of course these people, uh, in in Washington and elsewhere, and in Ukraine, of course, itself, are playing for the very highest stakes, and they have no reverse gear. I mean, about no. people wanting to continue the war, just to say this, and even escalate it. I mean, this is for this is for responsible state statecraft, which is the website of the Quincy Institute, and mm. it says this, and you know, this is you know, this comes from within the U.S. A foreign policy establishment. It's a more realist wing and it's critical of the policy, but it says many in the administration seem to actively wish to continue the war as long as is necessary to inflict an unconditional defeat on Putin or even bring him down. And then mm. there's a reference to a quote from Victoria Nuland. And there's mm -hmm. talk about anonymous reports from administration officials who want the war to continue for a decade or more <laughs> in order to guarantee that Russia will lose. Now, of course, if that's your plan, if you really want to think that you're going to bog the Russians down. By the way, this talk about bogging the Russians down has been... Stupid. I mean, they, they talked about that in Syria. They talked mm. about in Afghanistan, by the way, and they had some success there. But in the end, they mm. themselves got themselves bogged down. We must never forget mm. that. But, you, yeah. know, the, you know, all this talk, if, if, of course, on the contrary, it looks as if the Russians are not going to get bogged down. If, on the contrary, they are going to win. When mm. you set yourself these enormous objectives and you know, bring down Putin crash Russia, do all these kind of things. If that's not going to work, and if you're going to find yourself the loser, 
well, what do you do? And yeah. the pressure to double down and to intensify and to escalate in some way from these kind of people. I'm not saying everybody in the in Washington thinks like that. The Pentagon, I'm sure, doesn't. But these sort of people is going to intensify and grow. And, of course, when people start to look for means to escalate, well, all sorts of dangerous plans like the kinds we've been talking about start to, uh, uh, um, you know, float up to the surface. So I'm afraid I think this danger is extremely real. And, of mm. course, it's also inc extremely real in terms of Ukraine, because yeah. if they feel they're going to lose, which they are losing, if if it looks as if things are going to go terribly badly for them, well, what do they do? Their entire strategy, as far as I can see, has been to try to get NATO directly involved in the war. Yeah. And we've had all kinds of strange things like sending obsolescent Soviet drones flying into, was it Bulgaria or Croatia? I can't remember. Croatia. Yeah. Croatia. That was exactly. bizarre. That bizarre things. But you know, all these odd things like this have been happening. So mm. again, from their point of view, it, it, you, you can see that they have a compelling, mo compelling motive to mm. want something like that, some big event that they can package and sell to the Western public as requiring an urgent intervention to bring this to bring this thing to an end, when in fact, of course, it's not going to bring it to an end, it's simply going to escalate it. So, yeah. I mean, the line between disaster and, you know, not disaster is very narrow and yeah. it ultimately depends on some rational people in the department of defense in washington i suspect some rational people in the federal reserve board and the mm. treasury and commerce departments though there are also some very hardline people within the treasury um but you know when things are as precarious as that you cannot be at all confident that anything of anything things can always go hideously and disastrously wrong at any time yeah because like for instance i can speak with with some knowledge of the current situation in ukraine here on the ground and uh what is increasingly clear is that uh, the 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 isolated patches of the zelensky regime's forces uh, they're they're spread out they are not able to work together to any to do any kind of I mean, forget about counteroffensive. You know, just to defend themselves, they're, they're isolated. Uh, the, the Russians have successfully isolated these various pockets, and over the next two weeks to six weeks, it's just going to be an issue of slowly squeezing them closed. And there's going to be a lot of damage because the Zelensky regime. The, I think that they fundamentally recognize not Zelensky himself because he has always been a puppet, uh, first of Kolomoisky, the the oligarch. And now uh, it seems increasingly clear that he is held hostage by his own security people of the various uh, extremist groups that have uh, coalesced around the uh, Zelensky regime. Let's leave it at that. Uh, but we all know who we're talking about, and we can't say it uh, for the audience to understand, because if we do, we get into trouble with uh, YouTube and, and whatnot. And so we won't go into the specific groups, but we all know who we're talking about. And these groups essentially have Zelensky hostage. And so they're going to fight to the death because the Russians have made it very, very clear that insofar as the regular army, the regular Ukrainian army, they're going to welcome them with open arms at the end of this conflict. But those extremist groups are going to be prosecuted and the Russians are not going to show any kind of mercy towards them. And so especially in Mariupol, where you have um, uh, these battalions there, uh they know that this is a fight to the death and you're seeing what's happening in mariupol that they have no trouble whatsoever of absolutely destroying the entire city and uh, and putting uh civilian lives at great risk using them literally as human shields in order to uh keep the russians at bay but see uh, uh they can't win and so all that they will do is hurt ukraine kill ukrainian civilians needlessly and also soldiers needlessly and and these young men they're the flower of any country you don't want to lose them because they are the 
young men today who will be the adults, the leaders of tomorrow, and you don't want them to, to suffer needlessly, to die needlessly. But I think that the criminal Zelensky regime um, will do so. And I, I have to tell my uh, the listeners, your listeners, excuse me, I have to tell your listeners that I personally um, have felt victimized by this Zelensky regime. And so my uh, appreciation of it is rather emotional because I, I truly believe that they are just gangsters, thieves, murderers, uh, liars, uh, the worst sorts of people. Uh, and I have seen that up close and personal. I mean, do keep in mind, they assassinated one of their own negotiators on the suspicion that maybe he was helping the Russians in some way or other. They assassinated him. They have assassinated mayors. They have, they have uh, kidnapped and tortured uh, members of the Ukrainian parliament. They have kidnapped and tortured uh, famous uh, uh, mixed martial arts fighters merely for training with Russians. They're animals, as far as I'm concerned. And these animals, unfortunately, seem to have taken control of the Ukrainian uh, government. They control Zelensky, the puppet. And they will fight to the last Ukrainian to save their hides because the Russians know who they are and have no bones about their objective, which is to, you know, basically grab them and uh, string them up from the nearest lamppost. And I, for one, completely agree with that because I do believe that these people are animals who care nothing about Ukraine as a nation, the, the Ukrainian infrastructure, uh, or much less the Ukrainian people. And, and, you know, sorry for getting a little bit emotional about this particular issue, but I'm, I'm very, very adamant about how much I despise uh, these people who are currently in control of the Zelensky regime and who are just nefarious and horrible. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry, gentlemen. I, 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 I'm, I'm getting out of sorts on this particular issue. No, I mean, we just have to, we have to say that you are on the ground in Kharkiv and you've been there Absolutely. For, for, for a while stuck in this, uh, in this conflict. So, you know. Uh, oh, I don't mind being in, in the conflict. That, that doesn't bother me. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's not fun. I'd prefer to be in Tahiti if we're being <laughs> honest, right? But, uh, well, actually, no, I'm more of a snow guy. So if you could send me to Zermatt, I'd be happier there, but... Uh, no, that's not the problem. The problem for me is how that they have carried out um, political kidnappings and political assassinations during this conflict. And you yeah. would think that it's the last thing on their minds to be worrying yeah. about uh, political score settling in, in when your country is being uh, uh, invaded. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the Russians are calling it a special operation. It's an invasion. Let's call a spade a spade. Uh, but they are more concerned about settling political scores and intimidating people for pointing mm. out the truth mm. than for protecting their own country. And so I find them despicable. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. I'm afraid I yeah, am we, going we to have, have to. Yeah, we have to wrap yeah. it up. We have to wrap yeah. it up. Any, any final thoughts, uh, guys? Alexander Gonzalez? Well, I, I think up? we've covered an enormous amount of ground and we've said much, mm. be, very, very much. There's some, by the way, uncorroborated reports that the Chinese foreign minister is heading to Moscow tomorrow. We'll see what Really? Whether that's true, absolutely, which is, you know, probably a sign, you know, to indicate support and have a brief, you know, public briefings with the Russian leadership. So the, the Chinese are clearly, but, you know, I want to stress this is these are just reports. We haven't yet any, had yeah. any official confirmation from anybody. So we'll see what happens. We, we will see what comes. Yeah, my, my final note would be keep your eye on India, China. I think yeah. that if that pivot happens because of this crisis, yeah. it will be a realignment of the entire globe. It, it's I subtle, agree. but but it will be crucial. Yeah, I agree. And, I and agree. once again, gentlemen, thank you so much for having me on. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Gonzalo. Stay safe. And uh, we look forward to uh, having you on again very, very soon. Thank you to everyone that watched us on Odyssey, on Rumble, on YouTube and on uh, Locals, our amazing Locals community, the Durant.locals.com. If anything uh, happens with us and with our content, the first place to go to is the Durant.locals.com. And uh, thank you to our moderators. Thank you very, very much to our moderators. And to everyone that sent a question, whether it was on Rumble, on Odyssey, 
or on uh, YouTube, as well as in the locals chat. I will uh, gather up all those questions and Alexander will go through them and get them up tomorrow. We'll get answers to tomorrow. all those questions tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll have a, a really good Q and a video set up tomorrow as well. Gonzalo, stay safe, stay safe. Yeah, and, uh, let's have you on again really, Thanks. really soon. You have a, an open invitation whenever you want. Thank you so much. To come on. Thank you. Alexander, thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Mm.